All right, so uh, this next uh, 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 talk that I've put together are challenging cases in head and neck uh, cytopathology. And um, I hope I can share with you uh, some uh, information that will be helpful to you in general in evaluating uh, head and neck lesions. Uh, I have uh, several cases uh, uh, that include salary gland, thyroid, as well as um, other tumors that can be encountered in the head and neck. Uh, so this first case is an 84-year-old woman who presented with a three centimeter uh, right parotid gland mass that had been slowly enlarging for several years. So that's a pretty good sign for her that it's been present for several years. She had some intermittent preauricular pain, so pain in this area, and an FNA was performed. And what you can see in this aspirate is that it's a fairly cellular aspirate. We have uh, some cohesive groups of cells as well as some scattered single cells within the background. There's also a little bit of this sort of protonaceous material here, these sort of sec secretory material present in the background. And we can also see a little bit of a, these little tails, these little curly Q tails on some of the cells. Kind of a strange finding. We don't usually see that in salivary gland tumors. And then other groups of cells, as shown here, have ep an epidermoid look. They look squamoid because we have well-defined cell borders and they're very cohesive and they're forming this sort of almost flat sheet. And so this actually makes me a little bit concerned and I use the term epidermoid because we were starting to wonder, hmm, could this be mucoep? And then look at this. Here's one of these cells here and we saw these around, a, clear, a cell with a lot of clear cytoplasm. Um, it almost has, it has a sort of vacuolated look to it and the question is, are these, what are these clear cells? Are they mucin-producing cells or are they uh, sebaceous cells? So a little bit difficult to know, but if they're mucin-producing, then I really am worried about mucopidermic carcinoma. This is uh, another view of an alcohol-fixed pap-stained uh, preparation. And here, I think uh, you can appreciate that the nuclei are fairly uniform. There is a little bit of enlargement of some nuclei. The chromatin is even, the nuclear membrane is even, not really much atypia. And the cytoplasm is fairly abundant, and you might say that it has a little bit of an oncocytic look to it. And then this was on a liquid-based preparation of the celery gland FNA, where again, we have these bland cells, they're loosely cohesive, but really I wanted to point out that some of these cells had these little snouts on them. And uh, here's another one. And this is something that is reminiscent of apocrine change. So very strange combination. Epidermoid cells, some secretions, some that looks a little cystic, some uh, uh, clear cells, some apocrine uh, cells. So I'll just give you a moment to think about what, how would you classify this? What would be your FNA diagnosis? And I, I'm, I'm not gonna, yeah, I, I heard sump, sump. Yeah, so this would, this would, I think, this would be a great example of something you would put into that neoplasm, uncertain malignant potential category. Okay, I'm pretty sure it's a neoplasm, but I just can't exclude the possibility that it could be carcinoma. Uh, material was available for molecular studies and uh, this particular lesion was negative for fusions and mutations and importantly it was neg negative for mammal 2. So a majority of low-grade mucoeps have mammal 2 rearrangement so this is less likely to be a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So this patient had a superficial parotidectomy performed and what we see is that we have these sort of lobular arrangements, uh, nested arrangements of these uh, very cystic uh, uh, looking lesions. And then uh, there, there's a very dense uh, hyalinized stromal background. And some of these little dilated um, follicular groups have this uh, apocrine snouting, just like what we saw in the FNA. So very, very similar to what we were seeing in the FNA. And we also have these little sort of clear cells over here that uh, seem to be more sebaceous 
uh, than mucinous. So it really wasn't a mucin-producing tumor. And the diagnosis in this case was actually sclerosing uh, polycystic adenosis, also known by the acronym of SPA. And for those of you who do breast pathology, you know that this is analogous to the same lesion that you see in the breast. And keep in mind that many, many tumors in the salivary gland have analogs in the breast. They're very similar, and they even stain for similar um, immunostains, sometimes like GATA3 and GCDFP for many of the tumors. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of analogy between the breast and the salivary gland. Just a tiny bit of background to, to sclerosing polycystic adenosis. Um, it's, a, it's a rare microcystic salivary gland lesion, uh, first described uh, in 1996 by Smith et al. Again, it's the same disease as fibrocystic change and adenosis of the breast. It primarily occurs in the parotid gland. You don't really see this in other glands. And it occurs over a very broad age range, from little kids to adults. And in fact, I had a case um, about a year ago in a 12-year-old kid, and we were worried about a possible mucoepidermal carcinoma. Uh, but uh, uh, after doing tests and after excising it, it was, we were relieved to see that it was actually just this sclerosing polycystic adenosis. So they can do a very limited resection on, on these lesions. Um, in many cases, these are thought to be these were thought to be non-neoplastic, um, but there have been studies done looking at X inactivation that was detected in some of these, and so um, at least a subset of these are thought to be true neoplasms. They can occasionally recur, but it's very uncommon, and rarely they can show malignant transformation. So I, I would imagine that if it were a neoplasm, as with all the salivary gland neoplasms, um, there is always that potential for some kind of high-grade transformation to occur. Uh, and again, the treatment is, is a limited surgical resection. On cytology, um, the way you would maybe think about this lesion, and I, I don't think you're going to be able to make a specific diagnosis of this on FNA. It's going to be in that sump category, but you definitely want to have it in the low-grade category. It's this combination of sebaceous cells, squamoid or epidermoid cells, and that really weird apocrine change that I showed you. I'm not used to seeing that in the standard salivary gland tumors. Um, there may be a little bit of a protonaceous or even mucoprotonaceous background, and the lesions are usually positive for GATA3 and GCDFP, and negative for mammal rearrangement if you happen to do molecular studies. And this just shows you, um, here's an example of the sebaceous cells. Don't forget that in the parotid gland, sebaceous differentiation is normal. There are normal sebaceous cells in the parotid gland. There, there, there are not very many of them. And many of the tumors, including pleomorphic adenoma, can have sebaceous differentiation. And you would recognize it by, if you do ancillary studies, adipophilin and P16 are both positive in uh, sebaceous cells, adipophilin being probably the best one to use. And then again, uh, to recognize this, this is the apocrine snouting that I mentioned. And if I saw that, I would definitely think about this entity, sclerosing polycystic adenosis. So I just want to say a few words about cystic lesions in the salivary gland. Um, there are a variety of tumors that can be cystic. Um, and of course, mucoep, um, retention cysts, Warthin tumor, secretory carcinoma, some acinic cell carcinomas have a cystic uh, form, pleomorphic adenomas can be cystic, uh, there's a cystadenoma, cystadenocarcinoma, and of course certain met metastatic tumors, um, for example to intra and periparotid lymph nodes can be uh, cystic. Uh, this is just to show you for mucoepidermoid carcinoma, when we're dealing with the epidermoid cells, uh, you'll often see s sort of a little bit of a degree of atypia present there, and they're usually positive for P63, and you'd expect them to be negative for uh, GATA3 and GCDFP, which is different from the uh, uh, squamoid cells uh, that we saw in the uh, example of SPA. And then uh, when we're dealing with mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and this is one of the key considerations in the case that I presented, 
Um, what you'll see, any time you get an aspirate of a celery gland tumor and you have these big goblet-type mucin-containing cells that are also keratin-positive, that's virtually diagnostic of mucoepidermal carcinoma. You, do, you don't see this sort of haphazardly arranged three-dimensional um, proliferation of these uh, goblet-type mucinous cells in other types of uh, salivary gland tumors. So this would really strongly argue, just on cytomorphology alone, that you're probably dealing with a mucoep. And we didn't see anything like this in the, in the case of SPA. In fact, those clear cells, as I mentioned, were sebaceous cells. So key take-home points from this case, combination of sebaceous cells, squamoid cells, and apocrine snouting um, are features that we expect to see in sclerosing polycystic adenosis. Again, this kind of um, FNA is probably going to be diagnosed into that neoplasm, uncertain malignant potential category, but generally you're thinking of something low grade, and the clinician will know that the risk of malignancy is probably less than 35% or so. Um, again, uh, these aspirates of SPA lack the goblet type mucinous cells of mucopidermoid carcinoma. If you do molecular testing, they lack mammal 2 rearrangement, and the management should be conservative management for patients that have this kind of lesion. All right, the, uh, the next case uh, that I want to present is a 69 year old woman who presented with a slowly enlarging two centimeter non-tender, uh, and uh, I, I put this in so we're not really thinking of adenoid cystic carcinoma, non-tender parotid gland mass, and an FNA was performed. Now, for those of you who do a lot of salary gland cytology, you probably know the diagnosis just by looking at this. It's what we call in, in the United States an aunt mini. It has a particular look once you see it, when you see it again, you recognize it just by the way it looks. And this is a fairly characteristic appearance for what this tumor is. Unfortunately, uh, these are rare, very rare tumors, so we don't actually get to see a lot of them, and we may not be that comfortable diagnosing them. So we have a very cellular aspirate, lots of strip nuclei in the background, and um, also there's some funny looking material there. And then we have other groups of cells uh, that are very cohesive. And uh, basically what I would say you should recognize on this case is that we actually have a biphasic pattern of epithelial cells. So again, we have these cells out here that have this very delicate pale cytoplasm. And it's so delicate that it's, it's breaking up and, and giving us many strip nuclei. And then we have these uh, cells that have a higher in C ratio, that are, have darker nuclei, and they're very cohesive, and they're the ones surrounding this uh, material here. So it's some kind of base biphasic population of cells. And then here's a higher power view. Um, these are mostly the cells that have this abundant pale cytoplasm. And then we have this, um, secreted material. And at first you might think, hmm, is that like the matrix of adenoid cystic carcinoma? Well, it's a little bit different because it's this concentrically laminated. It's almost like a somomatous calcification, but it's, it's more protonaceous. So it's this concentrically laminated protonaceous secretion. So the secretion's different from some of the other matrix producing tumors. We do have occasional large spheres of cells, and this is one area that does make me a little bit concerned about the possibility, could this be something like adenoid cystic carcinoma? So I'll just give you a second to think about what your diagnosis might be. Um, at least in the Milan system, um, Maybe you put it into the neoplasm category. If you've seen something like this before, you might put it into suspicious for malignancy. So this is how we signed it out. Uh, neoplasm into the uncertain malignant potential category. Low-grade biphasic matrix-producing neoplasm. The differential includes epimyopathelial carcinoma, adenoid cystic, and a, an unusual cellular pleomorphic adenoma. Um, this uh, also had molecular testing, uh, negative for MIB, so it's probably not adenoid cystic. 
Negative for PLAG1 and HMGA2, probably not pleomorphic adenoma. Negative for EWSR1 rearrangement, so it's probably not a myopithelial carcinoma or, or myopithelioma. Uh, the patient went on to have a superficial parotidectomy, and here's the tumor. And this shows that nice uh, biphasic pattern. Um, you can see all of these clear cells. You can see these secretions uh, uh, produced. You can see why the cytoplasm was so delicate. It's, it's abundant and very clear, and this is what was so fragile on the FNA. And then this is another view that really very nicely shows the biphasic pattern with these uh, denser ductal cells here surrounded by these big, clear myoepithelial cells. So the diagnosis, yes, epithelial myopathelial carcinoma, very classic version of epithelial myopathelial carcinoma. So uh, this is a rare salivary gland tumor. Um, the par parotid gland is the most common site where this occurs. Uh, it typically occurs in adults a little more common in, in women than men. Uh, but the, the good news is that it's a low-grade malignancy. It can be locally aggressive, but tends not to be something that metastasizes. So it, overall, it has an excellent prognosis, and the appropriate clinical management is a conservative resection. And you can see that using the Milan system, if you placed it into this neoplasm sump category, usually that's gonna lead to a conservative resection, which is the appropriate management for this particular tumor. So um, basically on cytology, the key finding that's gonna tell you this might be um, epi epimophilocarcinoma is to be able to recognize the biphasic pattern. And usually the biphasic pattern is dominated by these myopithelial cells with abundant clear cytoplasm. They are, they have, their cytoplasm has a lot of PAS positive glycogen and then a smaller population of those more cohesive ductal cells. And then if you're lucky enough that you see those laminated proteinaceous secretions, that's also a clue that you might be dealing with an epimopithelial carcinoma. Now, in some cases, um, these tumors may consist almost entirely of clear myopithelial cells, and that can make the diagnosis a little bit more tricky on FNA because you might think it's a myopithelioma. And that's why I think the neoplasm sump category is a good one to place this into. This just is, a, again, just to drive home that biphasic pattern. And here's a view at very high power showing these myopithelial cells with the, the abundant clear cytoplasm and the more cohesive ductal cells with a higher NC ratio. Um, if you have material for ancillary studies, um, it's really great and it's actually aesthetically kind of beautiful because uh, you can use high molecular weight keratins and EMA to stain the ductal cells or if you want to stain the myopithelial cells and not the ductal cells, you can use stains for myopithelial cells. So smooth muscle actin, calponin, P63, or S100 could all be used to differentially stain the myopithelial cells while not staining uh, the ductal cells. Uh, so I think the pitfall when, when dealing with an FNA of epithelial myopithelial carcinoma is that there are some features of it that can make you worried about an adenoid cystic carcinoma. And the management for adenoid cystic is gonna be generally a radical resection and oftentimes a nerve sacrifice. And the features that can make you worried about adenoid cystic include these large spheres of cells. And I don't really have any tips to, to help you out with that. Uh, but in terms of these secretions, I already mentioned this. These, um, this secretion is, is different than the, than the homogeneous matrix that's produced by adenoid cystic carcinoma. This has this laminated a, a appearance to it, and that's not something that we're used to seeing in adenoid cystic carcinoma. This is actually a case report that we published. We actually had a very, very weird epimophilic carcinoma that had abundant adenoid cystic-like features. It had a lot of these secretions present within it. This is uh, the epimopithelial carcinoma on the left uh, compared with adenoid cystic carcinoma on the right. 
Um, the secretions at low mag can look kind of similar, but if you do ancillary studies, um, there are a lot more myoeps in the epimophacillial carcinoma that are going to be positive for S100, whereas adenoid cystic carcinoma tends to be more positive for CD117 as well as for MIB, whereas this one is not. So with regard to the differential diagnosis uh, for epimophacillial carcinoma, it would include other tumors of the salivary gland that can have clear cells. So these include myoepithelioma and myopithelocarcinoma. Oncocytomas can sometimes, as you know, look very clear. Sebaceous adenoma and sebaceous carcinoma that can occur primary in the salivary gland and have a lot of clear cell features. Uh, there's even a clear cell carcinoma that has a specific EWSR gene rearrangement. These cancers have never killed anyone, at least not in the literature. Uh, very limited uh, resection is appropriate for those, and if you do molecular testing, you can make a definitive diagnosis of that. Of course, lipomas, I think everybody in the room, we can recognize a lipoma on an FNA. Metastatic renal cell, I don't know why, but renal cell carcinoma tends to like to metastasize sometimes to the parotid gland. It's sort of fertile soil for that, and it can look very clear. And then there is a subset of mucoepidermoid carcinomas that can um, be very clear appearing. Um, so those are all different tumors that can have a clear, clear appearance. What I would say to you, if you have an FNA of a salivary gland tumor with clear cell features, ask yourself, why, why is the cytoplasm clear? Is it glycogen, in which case it might be myopithelial cells? Is it lipid, in which case maybe it's lipoma or maybe it's sebaceous? Um, is it condensed mitochondria, in which case maybe it's an oncocytoma? Um, or is it mucin, in which case we're going to be worried about a mucopidermic carcinoma? So I just want to show you a few of these entities in the differential. With regard to myopithelioma, um, this lacks the biphasic pattern of epimyopithelocarcinoma, and the cytoplasm is due to this glycogen-rich uh, material present. So if you do a PAS plus diastase stain, you'll see that you're dealing with glycogen. Um, if you're dealing with, with a myopithelocarcinoma, not always, but these are often high-grade tumors, again, lacking the biphasic pattern. Epimopathelial carcinoma does not have this much atypia. So if you see significant atypia like that, you're not dealing, th this would be diagnosed as a high-grade carcinoma, and that's, that's something that I think you could put in the malignant category, high-grade, whether you know specifically what it is or not. And then um, these uh, myopithelial tumors, uh, if you do molecular analysis, they may, may also have the EWSR rearrangement, but it's a different uh, fusion partner than the clear cell carcinoma. What about sebaceous carcinoma? So as you know, uh, the lymphatic drainage from the skin, the, the anterior part of the scalp and the face, is all to the intraparotid and periparotid lymph nodes. We often see metastatic cutaneous cancers, melanoma, squamous cell, sebaceous, et cetera, to periparotid and intraparotid lymph nodes, and these can include sebaceous carcinoma. You can also get sebaceous carcinoma primarily uh, arising within the parotid gland. Uh, my tip for this is adipophilin. It's a great marker that's positive in sebaceous carcinomas. Um, these are also positive for androgen receptor as well as for P16. And then finally, a few other clear cell tumors. Again, remember your renal cell carcinoma. Uh, we've had rare cases where the, they didn't know the patient had renal cell and we did the aspirin and we thought, oh, is it an oncocytoma or something like that? Uh, they can be very challenging, but if you have material for ancillary studies, it will mark like a renal cell carcinoma, of course, CD10 positive, RCC positive, lipoma is easy, oncocytoma, and low-grade mucoap. All of these can have clear cell features. So just the key take-home points, really epimopathelial carcinoma stands out from everything else by this really dramatic biphasic pattern, and that's what you sh should really look for. And if you can do ancillary studies, you can show that, wow, I have all of these great myoeps, and I also have this great ductal pattern. And then those uh, laminated proteinaceous secretions uh, should help you out to make the diagnosis, or at least to suggest it. Okay, the third case that I have, uh, this is a 28-year-old woman 
with a two centimeter left neck mass um, associated with the thyroid gland and an ultrasound guided FNA uh, was performed. So here's our FNA. Uh, we have dispersed cells and um, uh, maybe loosely cohesive, but many kind of um, is falling apart, sort of a single cell-like pattern. And one of the things that I would point out here is this sort of stippled chromatin pattern. And um, another term that you might use, um, I don't know if they use this in Portuguese, but salt and pepper chromatin. Okay, so it kind of has that neuroendocrine look to it based upon this sort of salt and pepper chromatin pattern, right? And some of these have a little bit of a plasma cytoid look to them. And then here's another view. I think this must have, this was a smear. Here it's a little more of a group of cells and uh, what I would point out is that there's really uh, not much atypia going on. We don't have necrosis or mitotic activity. The nuclei are fairly uniform with smooth membranes. And again, this really nice, smooth, stippled chromatin pattern. I think this, this is a, uh, um, another view. This is a liquid phase at very high magnification, just to show you that the cells were very bland. Uh, they do have a little bit of a almost spindle-like pattern. And here you can appreciate the plasma cytoid shape with the eccentrically located nucleus and the more abundant cytoplasm over here at this side of the cell. So with that, with a, one of these thyroid lesions, a thyroid tumor that has those features, you know, what are you gonna be thinking about? seems to be medullary carcinoma, but I probably wouldn't be showing you the case if it were just medullary carcinoma. Uh, but that, that, that was, yeah, exactly. So we, um, we were also worried. Uh, we put it into the suspicious for medullary, car suspicious for malignancy, um, and we called it suspicious for medullary carcinoma. Um, the differential diagnosis includes medullary carcinoma versus a follicular neoplasm. Uh, material for ancillary studies was not available. So we're kind of limited. That, that was a disappointment. So what do you do when you're worried about medullary cancer and you, don't have, you can't do calcitonin staining? You call your clinician or you email them and you say, hey, I'm listen, worried about medullary. Do a serum calcitonin on this patient. Um, so that was suggested. Um, a serum calcitonin was measured and was within normal limits. So pretty much that excludes medullary carcinoma, um, although I will say that there is a very, very rare subset of medullary carcinoma that has a low serum calcitonin level, but there, those, those are almost case reports. They're very uncommon. So this patient had a thyroid lobectomy uh, performed. And uh, here's the uh, surgical pathology. It still looks very much like uh, medullary carcinoma. We have these uh, uh, cells with abundant cytoplasm. Um, it's sort of a granular cytoplasm. We have our round nuclei. The cells are kind of loosely cohesive and they're in these uh, this sort of insular nested pattern with these little sort of spindle cells outlining the nest. Um, so what is your diagnosis? Um, let me show you a few immunostains. It is positive for chromogranate, so we were right salt and pepper chromatin, neuroendocrine differentiation. So positive for chromogranin. This is an S100 that shows these little positive S100 cells scattered around. So are you still thinking medullary carcinoma or maybe we're thinking something else? I heard uh, maybe a paraganglioma. Non-calcitonin non non-calcitonin producing some, so, so some kind of neuroendocrine uh, tumor or carcinoma. Well, um, here's a stain for keratin, so that's negative. So that, that, that rules out the potential for a neuroendocrine carcinoma or for medullary carcinoma. And indeed, uh, this is an example of an intrathyroidal paraganglioma. And I think I, pre I present this case just because in the head and neck, um, these paragangliomas, they're not that uncommon and they show up and uh, radiologically they're often able to diagnose them, but sometimes when these are in unusual uh, locations, we get FNAs 
and these can be misinterpreted as neuroendocrine tumor, neuroendocrine carcinomas. So the paragangliomas are derived from extra adrenal paraganglia um, of the autonomic nervous system. In the head and neck, the carotid body tumor is the most common. Um, over 30% of these in the head and neck are inherited. Um, 50 to 70% are sporadic. And when they're inherited, they have mutations in the SDH uh, loci um, and usually show SDHB loss. Less than 10% are malignant. And in the head and neck, they are rarely hyperfunctioning. Cytologically, what you're going to see is often a sort of a single cell pattern or very loosely cohesive groups plasma cytoid shape, and that stippled salt and pepper chromatin pattern. And this is uh, pretty much the classic appearance, as in the case that I presented, of something, okay, it looks neuroendocrine, it could be medullary cancer, but you're definitely going to need ancillary studies to work this up. And this, again, ancillary uh, single cells, um, and here the plasma cytoid shape. The differential diagnosis, of course, medullary carcinoma, you might also think about a parathyroid neoplasm that can overlap with the looks of paraganglioma. Um, sometimes they can be a little bit oncocytic and look kind of like a Herthel cell neoplasm. Metastatic renal cell carcinoma is also in the differential, um, as well as uh, metastatic neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, in terms of ancillary studies, uh, you, you are going to need some kind of ancillary studies, I think, to make the diagnosis. Um, so uh, key to this is keratin negative, negative for TTF1, thyroglobulin, and calcitonin, and PTH, positive for chromogranin and synaptophysin. Uh, S100, you'll see rare um, sustentacular cells, and NSC will also be positive. So I, mentioned, I alluded to this al already. Um, some of these paragangliomas are uh, associated with this inherited paragangliomma pheochromocytoma syndrome, and they're associated with loss of the mitochondrial SDH. So in the head and neck, whenever we have a paraganglioma, we always stain with SDHB, and if it's uh, loss, lost, it implies that you're probably, you may be dealing with one of these inherited paragangliomas, and it's important to recognize that because there's an increased risk for FEOs and for malignancy in these patients. Um, but in addition to this syndrome, some paragangliomas may be associated with other syndromes such as MEN2, VHL, or NF1, but usually the clinicians know that because uh, these symptoms uh, um, have uh, more prominent uh, features that are recognized clinically. So a key point would be beware of paragangliomas in, in, in aspirates of head and neck lesions because they, while, while usually they're at the carotid body and they're recognized on radiology, they can occur at unusual sites and they can closely mimic other tumors, especially other neuroendocrine tumors in the head and neck. Okay. Uh, this next case, this fourth case that I'll present, is a 45-year-old man with a 7.5 centimeter, so it's a huge mass, replacing the left lobe of the thyroid gland uh, with radiologic and clinical evidence of extension into the larynx and trachea and marked lymphadenopathy. This is a horrible tumor and looks uh, like bad news for this 45-year-old uh, man. And uh, here's the radiology, and uh, the yellow shows the thyroid gland. The orange uh, shows the tumor here uh, and, and right there, and it's moving down along the trachea. And uh, these red lines show this very large supraclavicular lymph node. This one is almost six centimeters, so really big lymphadenopathy. Uh, and also there is slight deviation of the trachea to the right due to this uh, tumor going down along the trachea. So an ultrasound guided finial aspiration was performed of this thyroid mass. Um, and here is the FNA. Uh, we have uh, sort of an interesting look. Um, we have a dispersed population of cells, some loosely cohesive groups, and then some cells that have sort of a bizarre look to them that I'll show you here at higher magnification, these really weird looking cells 
these huge, smudgy, dark nuclei, um, inclusions there, as well as a population of smaller sort of dwarf cells um, in the background. And here's another view, very bloody aspirate smear here. Um, again, with these big, ugly, bizarre tumor cells with these uh, big inclusions there and then smaller um, atypical cells, uh, epi epithelioid cells in the background. So given that clinical history and that appearance, what would you be thinking on, uh, on this thyroid FNA? So yeah, I heard anaplastic carcinoma and that's absolutely what we favored. Um, we, it was signed out as, you know, we hedged a little bit, carcinoma with high grade features. I'm not sure, I, I think I would have just said it's consistent with anaplastic carcinoma. But the person signing this out hedged a little bit and they said carcinoma with high grade features. And in the clinical context, the overall findings are suggestive of anaplastic carcinoma. So the patient's tumor was deemed inoperable due to this extensive disease and the proximity to the carotid artery and trachea. They got aggressive radiation and uh, chemotherapy um, and a restaging CT showed the tumor unchanged in size and still unresectable. And uh, this was even after uh, a year. That's weird, the patient shouldn't still be alive. Um, I'm not sure what prompted the clinicians to do this, maybe because they know that some thyroid tumors will respond to this therapy, uh, but they, they tried starting this patient on sunitinib, and um, the patient actually started doing better and um, for a total of 19 months, at which time the tumor was de deemed surgically resectable. So this, this is responding not like an anaplastic carcinoma. And the patient had a total thyroidectomy. Central and left neck dissection were performed. Uh, here's the tumor. Uh, these are the tumor cells, kind of loosely cohesive, and this very dense hyalinized stroma. Let's see. Here's a high power view showing, this is one of those bizarre uh, tumor giant cells down in here. Um, here's a, one of these ring cells, the plasma cytoid look. And this is a calcitonin stain, very strongly positive. This is Congo red showing the apple green birefringence. And this is actually a very rare example of a medullary carcinoma giant cell variant. Some people call it the anaplastic variant. These are a little bit more aggressive than the usual medullary carcinomas, but not as aggressive as true anaplastic thyroid carcinomas. So this, this um, patient still had very aggressive disease and uh, eventually died from, from uh, metastatic uh, tumor, but they live much longer than one would live with anaplastic carcinoma. So just to give a little bit of summary for medullary cancer, it's a tumor that I, I'm particularly interested in. Um, they are derived from the C-cells and in fact inherited versions have C-cell hyperplasia in the background. Um, about 75% um, are sporadic and 25% are inherited. Uh, lymph node metastasis is, is common and that's where we come in as cytopathologists because we get the patient with an enlarged lymph node and we do an FNA and you see a dispersed population of single cells that kind of have that neuroendocrine look. Always think of medullary carcinoma. This, met, this giant cell variant is extremely rare and I hope none of you ever are unfortunate enough to encounter one of those uh, because it, it does look very much like an anaplastic cancer. Oh, and sunitinib is one of these um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that actually is having really good results on patients with medullary carcinomas. Uh, this would be the standard aspirin of a medullary cancer, right? In a thyroid FNA, you see something like this with this uh, salt and pepper chromatin dispersed cells. It's either medullary carcinoma or it's a paraganglioma, right? And paragangliomas are very rare intraparotid. We never make a definitive diagnosis of medullary carcinoma, though, without doing the stains or knowing the serum calcitonin level. 
There are a variety of variants of medullary cancer. It's kind of like melanoma. It's the great mimicker. And that's why um, medullary cancer can be a little bit challenging. Here's a spindle cell variant. Um, you might think of anaplastic cancer, but it lacks the atypia, necrosis, and mitotic activity, activity of medullary cancer. This is the oncocytic variant where it can look very much like a Herthel cell tumor, and that can be a major pitfall because the treatment for medullary cancer is a total thyroidectomy and some form of neck dissection. The treatment for a Herthel cell neoplasm is a lobectomy, so they're different. Uh, so anytime I get an aspirate that I'm thinking of, of Herthel cell neoplasm, I always look very carefully. And one, one tip I'll give you is that even though you may have a prominent nucleolus in some cells, a majority of the tumor cells in the background actually don't have that big prominent macronucleolus like we expect to see in a true Herthel cell neoplasm. And the take home message is, if you have a thyroid aspirate with single cells or unusual pattern, always consider medullary cancer. Again, before I make a definitive diagnosis of medullary cancer because of the clinical implications for management, I want to do either immunochemistry for calcitonin, which is here strongly positive, or if you don't have material for ancillary studies, just tell your clinician to do a serum calcitonin, which is almost always uh, very high. So medullary cancer has many different cytologic and histologic appearances, so sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's more challenging. Uh, I showed you the giant cell variant just to emphasize that you have to keep it in mind. I will say, in retrospect, the smudgy nuclei, the lack of necrosis, and the lack of mitotic activity in that aspirate was not characteristic of anaplastic. And also, the patient was on the young side, 45 years. So there were some very subtle clues that maybe this wasn't an anaplastic carcinoma. Anyway, keep medullary in mind. If you think of it, you'll get it right, because you can always get the serum calcitonin. The last case that I'll very quickly present, and I just wanted to, well, you'll see why for obvious reasons. 95-year-old uh, guy came into my FNA clinic. He had a clinical history, and that helped me because I knew right away what, what this was going to be. But I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'm going to make you guess. So there was a three-centimeter right upper neck mass, and an FNA was performed. And uh, what we see are these scattered uh, single cell pattern in the background with a lot of blood. Um, here we have another view of this. Um, again, there's a little bit of clustering, but mostly a single cell pattern, um, uh, uh, some nuclear pleomorphism, large nuclei, and a little bit smaller. That's another view of it. And then this is the view I wanted to show you because there's uh, some molding going on here. Um, so uh, with, with all of these features and, and also high NC uh, nuclear ratio, uh, this was, uh, let's see, Clicker. There we go. Uh, any test that you would like to perform. So some ancillary studies could be performed on this. Uh, this is a synaptophysin, which happened to be positive. We were thinking, could this be some kind of small cell carcinoma based upon the small cell size and the nuclear molding? So positive for synaptophysin and positive for keratin. Um, but would you want to see any special keratin? So you know it's some kind of neuroendocrine cancer. Wow, it's like a plant in the audience. Keratin 20, so this is actually keratin 20, and it's positive. And so that, and, and here's the rest of the profile. Um, we also did a CD99 and a Desmond, which were both negative. I'll just mention to you, I didn't have time to, to present this particular case, but just as a caveat, beware that there is a rare subset of rhabdomyosarcomas and Ewing sarcomas that can have keratin and neuroendocrine positivity. Whenever I get something I think is a small cell cancer, especially not, not in the lung, but like in the head and neck in a weird spot where you wouldn't expect it, or if you don't have a history, um, I, I usually throw in a Desmond and a CD99 just to be careful because we've been fooled before. So your, di your FNA diagnosis, I think you know it now, metastatic Merkel cell carcinoma. And the patient came into my clinic. He had had a Merkel cell carcinoma a year ago on his forehead, and now he had this big neck mass, and I was sure it was going to be Merkel cell. We do the FNA. It looks like small cell carcinoma. It's Merkel cell. 
I just quickly wanted to mention common metastatic tumors in the head and neck. Squamous cell tops the list, and you always have to think about doing HPV testing or EBER testing if it's nasopharyngeal or from the oropharynx. Thyroid cancers, papillary, medullary, and anaplastic, uh, followed by uh, melanomas, um, again, the nasopharyngeal cancer, various neuroendocrine carcinomas, including Merkel cell, and then rarely in the head and neck, usually the patient has a history, will get distant mets such as lung, breast, and kidney. Those are the top three. And <clears throat> just to, to show you, um, when you're thinking of neuroendocrine carcinoma, um, Merkel cell is going to be keratin 20 positive. The pulmonary type of small cell carcinoma generally is keratin 20 negative. And then also remember, there is a neuroendocrine carcinoma that's positive for calcitonin that's not medullary carcinoma. Um, it, it's, it's one of these moderately differentiated uh, uh, or atypical carcinoids, often arising from the supraglottic larynx, and they metastasize to lymph nodes. So if you get an FNA of a lymph node and it's neuroendocrine carcinoma and uh, calcitonin positive, um, the difference is these tumors have a normal serum calcitonin. Medullary carcinoma has an elevated serum calcitonin. So let me just advance to the next slide. There we go. So uh, key points, location is important. I didn't have time to go into the different levels of lymph nodes, but depending upon which lymph node level is involved in the head and neck, Will, will limit your differential diagnosis. And there are tables. You can, I have tables over my desk. I can just look at them and say, okay, this is level three, level two, level five, et cetera. And I know the differential for what that tumor is going to be. And tumors with neuroendocrine features, of course, can be particularly challenging. And you always want to have material for ancillary studies. Thank you.